Very good. So, um, uh, welcome. We are in Paris for the last um, two talks of the season. And uh, tonight uh, we have uh, two guests. And I will, um, for, the, for the first time of the season, do the introduction for them. I will be the facilitator and will be, I will be with you. So, the first person we will have tonight, come, please come <laughs> together with me, Claudia. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Claudia. So you just arrived in Paris this afternoon for this talk? Yes, I did. And is it your first time in Paris? No. no, but it has been a while since I was here. When you were a young kid at the time? No, I was here for a book fair like about five years ago. Okay, so not so yeah. long ago. <laughs> so, um, so Claudia Klatt, she's a, she's a design director of, of, of SPIN. Um, uh, that the studio formed by Tony Brooks uh, more than 20 years ago, I don't know how long it was. Yeah, it yeah was it's about 25 years. 25 now. years. <laughs> um, so Claudia works alongside with, with him on, on the team. This studio has a great influence in the UK as, as well in the world. It's also the studio behind the unit edition who publish a lot of graphic designer monographies from Herb Berlin to Win Con Conwell on, on many others. But Claudia was born in Zurich. Uh, she studied in, in this city, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right after, she decided to move to London f to start her career. Later, she, she, she joined a unit edition on work on many of these monographies published by, by the publishing house. Today, Claudia uh, works alongside SPIN founder, Tony Brooks, Brooke on the team. At SPIN, she handled a project for the BBC Craft Council, Dick uh, Delf, Ministry of Sound, Pro A Foundation, University of the, of the Creative Arts, and Wallpaper Magazine. Besides this, she also likes to experiment with typography, blending the analog with the digital, making conceptual lettering, and she conducts work, workshops on, on, on things like that. The studio as aesthetics brings together the rigorous, the refined, and the irrelevant in the search for the new surpri surprising letter forms. Result of such experiments can be seen on spin publication, irregular publication, I think, yes? How many, how many of these uh, series was published? The Adventure of Typography. Uh, so far, two. Two, so, yeah, and when it was started? When, when it started, this publication? Sorry, when? When yes. it started, uh, we published the first issue last year, yeah. and uh, just brought out couple of months ago the second issue yeah so welcome yeah. thank you very much So yeah, hello everyone, and thank you very much for coming. I know the roll call is on, and uh, it's been crazy. I had I had the feeling I had to watch France, the France game yesterday to like acclimatize to Paris. Um, it was quite crazy. I was in a pub, and uh, I, I don't know. At some point, I had like paint in my face, fear dropped over me, and fight starting. It's like, this is insane. But um. Glad you all could make it here. So I, I'm really excited to show you some uh, of our new projects. But first, I would like to uh, explain a little bit how we work at SPIN. So as uh, Jean-François uh, mentioned before, we have several different things happening. So um, our main, um, well, our main reason, we have like client work, which makes the biggest part out of our project. But we also have unit editions, which is uh, founded by Adrian Shaughnessy and Tony Brook 
It's a, a self-publishing house that was founded around 2009. Uh, so we design a lot of books for them. It's uh, books about graphic design and visual culture. <coughs> and another part which is very essential are self-initiated projects. These are projects, uh, they are not client related, so these are passion projects where we have uh, room to experiment and try out new things we are interested in. And all of that is kind of quite interconnected, so like unit editions is very inspirational because you have to deal with loads of like interesting graphic design content, then um, that influences maybe self-initiated projects and from that we might get commissions uh, for like a real client project. So it's a very like a life structure in a way. I, I, cl uh, I, I like to refer them like to refer as them to like a spinning platters. So you have to make sure that you always like keep them spinning so everything keeps moving. Um, I thought I'll, I'll show you a selection of identities where uh, type is the main feature of the identity. Um, Proa was also mentioned before. Um, this is a cultural institution based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So after they refurbished their uh, museum, they approached us to come up with a new identity that put them onto the international stage. So it was in important that they appear international, but they are still rooted in the local environment. So their museum is located in Buenos Aires in the La Boca district where this beautiful bridge is quite prominent. So that's a very important landmark. So we came up with a concept that um, we built a typeface inspired by the bridge, which basically makes the main building block out of the identity. So these are almost like mechano-like um, elements that build up this typeface. So we basically uh, sketched out our idea and then worked together with a type designer <coughs> in, uh, in Germany to make it a, a real typeface. So it can be quite uh, expressive but also practical. So on posters you can use it quite big but on other material it will be more <coughs> recessed. And it's also supported by other um, like supportive typefaces, in this case, prestige and accurate. Here are some tickets. Oh, excuse me. I have to take this off. <laughs> I was so proud to wear it. <laughs> And a very important uh, aspect was that they don't have a lot of money to produce material, so we had to come up with a solution that <coughs> works on a, a photo photocopy machine. So all this material is just printed out in-house. But it brings its own like nice aesthetic with it. This is a press kit. And again, like this, uh, the signage was built out of uh, laser cut uh, wooden letters and just painted and mounted onto the wall. Quite a nice solution, especially when the, the sun hits the light. So a couple of years in, um, they started to um, put up this uh, program where they show uh, concerts, um, films, theater. So they wanted to have a, a small little identity for that itself. So we built uh, another typeface that's related to the original Proa typeface, um, but indicating like nightlife, glow in the dark letters.
And this year they just opened up a new um, exhibition space called Proa 21. Um, it's a new space where they, um, it's a place of experimentation, creation and research where they show a more progressive program. So basically this is like the, the youthful outlet of the Proa uh, institution, which is around for already like 20 years. So again, just about this typeface, um, in the original proposal we had a couple of different routes and this was one of the original um, typefaces we proposed as well because in the La Boca district they have like um, a lot of facades which have this corrugated iron and if the sun hits this facade it creates like these really strong lines and it happened to be that the facade of this new building has that as well. So <coughs> this is kind of a play on that. So I think it's a very nice example of how type can work very nicely in an identity as an expressive um, element. Some toilet signs, like those. <laughs> and a possible poster series for an upcoming exhibition. So together with this typeface, the supporting typefaces, and how you know the structure, um, the images, and the, the text can be, like can form a really nice flexible identity. And the next uh, project I would like to show you is about Collect, which is an international art fair uh, which is held at the Saatchi Gallery in London. Um, our task was to give the fair an international profile and alter the perception of um, craft. It had quite like an outmoded attitude to it. So that's what we were dealing with. with. They had like this identity before which was quite rigid. So they wanted to have something that's more flexible and more expressive. So we thought like, okay, let's do something that's contemporary, modern, impactful uh, and has also the possibility to be entertaining. So we came up with this mark. Um, for this logo type, we used uh, Brauer Neue, which is a typeface that originally um, was designed by nephew, Me no, uh, by Pierre Meetinger, which is the nephew of Max Meetinger, who is the creator of Helvetica. <laughs> you all know that probably. <laughs> So Electrosmog just redrew, like draw the, like digitalized the, the typeface for use and line to um, created a whole family around <coughs> that. So I think that um, this was kind of an appropriate typeface to use because it's quite like a strong bold typeface but has these rounded edges which makes it you know a bit nicer and approachable, not too hard. And the idea with the italic L's is that a collection starts with two items. So that's a, a small hint to like the work collect, which we quite liked. So now we have um, different iterations of that logo type. So the, the, the italic uh, L's form the basic mark, which is the seed of our identity, which can be later on like used as graphic and a graphic element and then we also have like different iterations of the mark itself. So depending on like where you want to use it, you have the choice and you're not stuck to just one, one mark. And again, we really like icons. <laughs> 
a little family for the toilet signs, which will be used in the signage of the whole exit, like whole fair. So these were some invites for um, private view and, um, and so on. Exclusive private view and collectors, I don't know, there are like so many different invites. <laughs> Here's another one. Yeah, so it can be quite playful with those elements. Yeah, and um, the signage qu made quite an, imp an impact within the whole um, exhibition itself, having suddenly like this very strong contrasted elements there, kind of like gave the exhibition <laughs> itself a presence where before that might have not been the, the, the case. So this year, no, that was last year, <laughs> we were uh, commissioned again to develop the identity for this year's uh, fair. So I'm just showing you a couple of slides of our initial presentation. Um, so these are some sketches we showed them. We thought like, okay, let's go away from this really strong contrast black and white thing and make it more you know, delicate and light and floaty. We proposed to bring in some colors, which you can't see here <laughs> very well. As well on the catalog. Yeah. Some sketches for some animation for, you know, social media content and whatever you need. So in the end, we refined it and we uh, had like a set of graphics which were like very dynamic. It was all like outlined and delicate and light, which we then could apply to all the uh, materials. So they weren't really brave enough to go with colors. So everything stays still black and white. So hopefully next year we can take on some colors for the next identity. <laughs> yeah, so this year like we we were able to like go a bit more into the space of the graphics and we tried to like pull it around like all the corners and make it more immersive. Yeah, and I really wanted to have one of those jumpers, but uh, I didn't get one in the end. They were all taken, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, the BBC Creative uh, is the BBC's in-house creative team. So they were like formed newly together like two years ago and they wanted to have a new identity to attract new talent to their teams. So um, their ambition is to be the most creative organization in the world. So we had to <laughs> try to bring that into the identity so we had like the, the three BBC blocks and we wanted to add a fourth box which basically represents uh, the creative box. So we were like exploring, okay, how could that box look like? It could be just a square, I like, can't be it. So we had like different iterations of a box. And then at some point we realized like when we take out uh, some lines on one side, it kind of creates a C. So 
So that, that's a great thing. Why don't we make um, boxes that look like a C? So we came up again like with a set of different logo lockups. which again uh, can be played with. So it's not like a rigid identity. You can uh, play around with it and, you know, like add graphics to it, change the form. So there's always like a, <laughs> we always try to push the boundaries, like here it gets maybe a bit crazy, but you know, like there are places to go. So it doesn't mean that you have to go in the beginning right there, but over time, you'd be grateful that you have the chance to like, you know, mix it up from time to time if needed. So we had the great opportunity to uh, put up some uh, super graphics in the BBC building. And there were some issues with like the working spaces because like when you have a desk in front of a super graphic that has a lot of lines in it, it can create headaches. So we had to be careful like where we put them. So this is like a hallway where, where we could uh, put a more expressive version out. And it really gives again like a the whole space and identity. So as soon as you're on that floor where the uh, BBC Creative is located, you know, like, oh, okay, they are here. And people, like, they were really, like, happy with, like, having an identity and, like, felt like, oh, I'm working in the cool bit of the BBC, you know. <laughs> So you can see that like where workspaces are, the, the, the graphics are a bit uh, pulled back. And uh, with the identity comes com some applications like tote bags or um, stamps, which they can use for letterheads and what so. So uh, the BBC just launched this year a new typeface. So they used to have Gil Sands and they worked with Dalton Mark for a long time on a new um, typeface called BBC Reith. Uh, Mr. Reith was the founder of the BBC, so there's like a very strong connection to their history. Uh, with that new typeface, um, they're now able to um, you know, apply to print, uh, web, and it has like a, a presence everywhere and can be easy. It's, it's easy to use. So our campaign was an in-house campaign to basically um, put it out there, announce it, um, make the people understand why it was there. So we worked with the BBC creative team together on this campaign. They came up with like all these um, phrases where it explains like why, why they uh, commissioned a new typeface. And it's a really nice example how like, uh, playful and creative you can be with it. So, because like, if you just see like, a typeface sheet, you sometimes think like, oh, that's a really boring typeface, or it's like, so reductive, and I can't do anything with it. But it turned out to be like, a, a, like, a very like, playful thing to do. So all these like animated posters were on the screen within the BBC and they also had a couple of them printed.
So with this guide also, uh, with this campaign also came a, an online guide for um, the BBC um, people. So there was like an internal website where you can click through um, a website to like get used to or like understand like why they have this new typeface and how to use it, what cuts are available, type sheets and all sorts of stuff. I just want to show you a couple of unit editions books as well. Um, since we are having a type conference here, <laughs> uh, I just want to show you a couple of type related books. So a couple of years ago, we brought out type only, uh, which is in other words, just um, typography on its own. So we uh, asked contemporary designers to submit their works um, to showcase in this book. So it's a wide variety of different, uh, different work. We also uh, rooted it back into the graphic design history. So here, this is a Carl Gerstner uh, poster. And do you know who's that from? <laughs> no. Uh, the, on the right hand side is Anton Bieke, I think, and on the left hand side, I always forget her name, but it's Josef Müller Sprockman's wife. Do you know her name? <laughs> Josef Müller Sprockman's wife. Japanese lady? Yeah? Uh, I should have written it down. Yeah, so the main body of the book consists of like very expressive, experimental typography. <coughs> and we also had a follow-up book with that, um, which is called Type Plus, where again, like typography is the main feature of their work, but it's combined with imagery, illustrations, and other graphics. Yeah, so it was like a quite a contemporary fun thing to look through. Uh, Julian Schroeffer, um, he's a Dutch designer. He used to work for Total Design. I think his peak time was like during the 60s and 70s. Uh, he's a very experimental typographer. Maybe typographer is the wrong word since it's more graphic. But um, <coughs> Frederike Hugen, who wrote the essay, refers to him as the computer designer before the computer. This is Mr. Shurian Schroeffer. And he did like a lot of these very constructed typefaces. <coughs> And then like very expressive and almost psychedelic typography. <coughs> I find it incredible to like, you know, that he did draw this all by hand. I mean, I can't relate to that. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how about, about you, but I wouldn't be able to do some, I had the patience for that. And then we did like another book about Herb Lubalin, who's an uh, American graphic designer. Uh, this book only features his typography work. He himself claimed not to be a great typographer because um, he's, he thought like he's terrible because he doesn't follow the rules. But we thought like this book basically proves the opposite of it. So it contains like a little history about where he comes from, his setup, and then like a lot of typography work.
Isn't he nice? <laughs> I just want to mention that um, we're just republishing our first monograph, which is about Herb Lubelling's complete work. Uh, thanks to Kickstarter, uh, we, were we were able to reprint it. So because we always like run very low numbers, like only like 2,000 um, issues per book, uh, they sell out quite fast. So we were really happy that we can put that out there again. Yeah, that was one of my first projects actually, where I could go to the Herb Lubelin Study Center at the Cooper Union. So I uh, if you have the chance and you are in New York, it's really worth stopping by. So the whole archive is accessible. You can look through all the avant-garde magazines and all the material which is basically in the book comes from there. Um, it was quite an experience. And then I also want to touch on uh, Adventures in Typography, uh, which is a self-initiated project by SPIN. Um, so we, it's basically a, a, a continuation of our monograph we brought out a couple of years ago, which is this one. Um, so we felt like there's always like so much material during like a client project that doesn't get used and we really like and kind of we felt like we would like to uh, develop that further or like share it with the world as well. So this is a, a selection of that material where we like had the chance to like experiment and like you know um, give us also the room to do like you know projects or like uh, visual explorations that maybe fail, but like, you know, bring you to a new point, to like new visual material. And as I mentioned before, we just brought out Adventures in Typography 2, so I just want to like talk you a little bit through these projects in more detail. Um, so this issue was basically inspired by our move into a new studio space. We just uh, moved from a conventional studio space into a garden, basically, um, which you can see here. Um, I guess we were like I aspiring this idyllic work situation that uh, Otto Eicher studio had in, in Algoy. Just, I don't know, it just feels like more creative than like when you have like your set desk, it's more flexible. It's just, it's a very different way of working. Now we have a, a vegetable garden from where we can cook from, herbs. So. Oh. So sorry. So um, what we thought, like, okay, this is kind of like for us, it marked a new beginning. So we thought, like, okay, um, how do you, how do you mark a new be beginning? Okay. So we found like a, a series of count-offs we really like to work One, with. Down there. 
So this is the list of all the count offs we could find. And it's quite interesting how different they are to each other. Like each had like its own character in a way. Because you just would think like it's just one, two, three, four. But apparently isn't, yeah. So that was a lot of fun to research. And also to like put together all these numbers was quite a challenge in the end. <laughs> so some of them are like oh, a bit out there, but we think like it's quite fun. So another thing that kind of yeah, I don't know, like now we had like a vegetable garden. So we thought like, well, wow, let's <laughs> we were growing lettuce at the time. Um, let's do something with that. <laughs> so which first like it started as like a silly idea, but then we kind of realized like, oh, they make actually really beautiful shapes. So Yeah, had a lot of fun doing that again. Especially when you like uh, punch those counters in there, they become a bit more interesting, like the contrast between this organic form and this very geometric circle, for example. And we also like the word lettuce letters because it's kind of a tongue breaker. So, yeah. And then we said, let's make some futuristic lettering that is all wrong. We are proportions with inconsistent forms. So you probably all hate that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you professional typographers. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm, just from, I'm just being silly. <laughs> so let's start at the very beginning a very good place to start. When you read, you begin with A, B, C. Do you know where it is from? That phrase? Yes! <laughs> ah. <laughs> so we kind of explored the possibility of like building a flexible typeface that can move around, where you have like ver variable glyphs that you can mix up. It's definitely pushing the boundaries of legibility. I was actually just looking at one letter before where I thought, what is that again? Is that an R or an H? I guess it depends on the word. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely like a playful thought behind that. And we couldn't resist to animate it and make it sound like futuristic aliens. So uh, Jonathan took the microphone and started to like do this sound design for it. So don't, just to prepare you, there's like an army of letters coming next. Yeah, that can go on forever. <laughs> and so Helvetica just turned 60 last year. So we thought, okay, let's have a go at Helvetica. So we were imagining, so what if Helvetica was like Dorian Gray and every time it got used and abused, it got older and more worn out. So, and this is the result of that. So we cut out these shapes of Helvetica and crinkled it up. In this video we try to like just throw the word alt in, which is German for old, but we just didn't like manage to to do it. Like we were like, oh, this is a cut video, it goes on for 10 minutes, the original one. I didn't want to do that to you. <laughs> so even in the end where I tried to like put it in order, it wasn't quite in the frame. Was just silly.
So then we thought, okay, that's not good enough. So can we breathe some new life into Helvetica by taking a sharp scalpel and perform surgery on it? So that's, we call it Dr. Frankenstein's Helvetica. You thought it's over, right? <laughs> so that's where probably like all the typographers screaming, which th just didn't want to let go of Helvetica. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> no, I'm happy you're looking at me. <laughs> so yeah, we took a scalpel and started to like take it apart and know, build different letters out of it. Try to give it a new, new form. So here you can see the other part of the studio where our workshop table is. So we had, um, we were watching that uh, trailer from Dr. Frankenstein, uh, Dr. Fran Frankenstein's monster, and it had like this very graphic uh, words in there called like thrilled, and so that where these words come from, we thought like we just use that as material to form words. And here he is, Mr. Frank, Dr. Frankenstein's monster. He looks very satisfied, I think. <laughs> so yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, the imaginary operation failed. And it turns out we're just graphic designers and not surgeons. So Helvetica had to die. And we just founded some uh, obituaries by Wolfgang Weingart, for example. Anyone who uses Helvetica knows nothing about typefaces. That's all he had to say. Or Eric Speakerman. Most people who use Helvetica use it because it's ubiquitous. It's like going to McDonald's instead of thinking about food because it's there, it's on every street corner. So let's eat crap because it's on every street corner. <laughs> so you can agree or disagree with that. So Helvetica turned into ashes. These are the remains. So another idea we had, let's stick tape in the shape of type to our heads while wearing black nylons, bank robber style. So we thought let's build tape face Again, like a little stupid joke. We can't help it. <laughs> um, so the idea with the nylons came from the worry that if we actually stick tape to our face, we won't have eyebrows anymore. <laughs> so uh, it didn't turn out how we imagined, but we thought like the result is still kind of surprising and interesting. 
this is the letter T, just in case. <laughs> A lowercase a. And then uh, Tony um, also had this very beautiful tape with stripes on it. He brought it back from Tokyo, so he just had to go with that as well. It's basically um, inspired, or um, how do you say, an homage to Franco Grignani, which we like a lot. <laughs> so this was the attempt to build an S, and then, uh, yeah, we just dressed up in an overall and, you know, just went a bit overboard. <laughs> <coughs> then another um, experiment, uh, this is what we call it body text, where we form um, letters out of our hands, so we stuck tape to our fingers and we had like two people trying to form those letters together. And we thought, I got it. They look a little bit like, you know, lighter gloves, or I don't know, had like a weird touch to it. So we spelled out the, the title of a song we liked a lot, Warm Letterettes, which is the original is, I think, from a, a punk band from the 70s. And Grace Jones, I think she did another uh, version of it as well. It's a good song, you should check it out. So, and all this material um, ended up in our latest issue of Spin's Adventures in Topography. So I just want to show you one of our latest projects. And this, is a, this commission is a direct result of our self-initiated project, Spin's Adventures in Typography. So they approached us to, um, to come up with a graphic illustrations for their new campaign today at Apple, where they uh, give workshops with like musicians, artists, coders, like all sorts of people to use their, you know, their um, computers in a creative way. So these illustrations will like, end up on a big screen in Apple stores. And they reference directly like some graphics we did in, in that magazine. So they had like a quite strong, they already like directed, they gave us the direction in which they want to go to. So we thought like, okay, let's do some more experiments um, and explore like these like physical letter forms a bit further. So this is like where we try to like form type out of tape. And some of them are a bit more weird. Uh, Jonathan had the idea to fill like a stocking with uh, r like foam you use for sh sh like shaving foam. And this is just shaving foam on its own. <coughs> or like drops of oils, which was quite a challenge actually. But it's just interesting how material can uh, inform those letter shapes. So this should play, hopefully. There are also some experiments. They go um, not as intended. So here we had like this uh, isolation foam. We thought like, oh, that will look great when you like draw letters. But you can see in the background, like all the foam just looks like a little pile of something, you know. <laughs> 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 so 
So, so we tried to build a letter and like cover it, but you know, it was just a bit of a mess in the end. Still a lot of fun to do. <laughs> So I'm just ta take you through the whole process. So when we like uh, work like this, we do a lot of experiments, workshops, and then at some point we collate all the material and we print it out on the wall. So <coughs> it's just good to have a visual reference and leave it there for a while. So you uh, have some time to realize like what's working and what's not working. So at some point we go through like all the, the sketches and we put like dots on it so we know like where like where we want to develop something or what to discard. So, and all of that goes, like, in the end into a presentation. Um, so, it, it was not like a finished thing, so we just wanted to share the process with the Apple team so they can say, yes, no, that's working, or we like this more than that, so we can, like, focus on a, on a certain, you know, route, if you want so. So these are like loads of different iterations, like sh should it just be the word today because it's quite a wide screen and it was hard to um, bring the three words onto the screen together in a nice manner. So there are a lot of iterations, but that's how we usually, like if there's like an open process, it's how we usually uh, work with our clients, give them a lot of options to choose from. We also look at the color. And then in the end, just to make it more digestible, we just like formed all the, the letters together. So it's a bit easier to digest. So they can basically cherry pick what they like. So, but um, in the end, they were like quite happy with the general directions. Um, the only input they gave us is that like they would like to have all the words today at Apple on one screen, and that we should explore color a bit further. So, this is uh, the development of the previous uh, exploration. And then this is Korean. <laughs> so they asked us to like um, also make a specific screen just for the new store in Seoul. <coughs> and this is, the translation is Seoul. So again, like this is a, um, so 
some exploration around those Korean glyphs, which we weren't really familiar with. We were like a bit unsure, like is that still legible or not? But then they seem to be okay with it. And then we got to a refinement stage. Um, we basically chose like a certain um, you know, layout, like a, a combination of letters they liked. Um, and we refined the type. So this is the final composition. Um, this is just an animation we did for ourselves because the, the final illustration was just a, a still. But you know, we thought like it's such a, a rich, we had so much rich material, it would be a shame to not animate it. So that's the big screen. I can't wait to see it somewhere. <laughs> It'll be quite impressive. Yeah, so we um, just recently like celebrated one year at the, the studio. So I just wanted to show you a little bit like what we did. We invited a couple of guests, some collaborators and friends um, to celebrate with us. <laughs> so we took the opportunity to like do a little bit of you know a thing so we um we called it like a, a spins adventures in typography night uh, where we like showcased a couple of things and we made some specific installations just for for them to look at uh here we um just uh, painted a super graphic within uh, in our studio uh, this form you see in the background comes from a new project we are um, working on at the moment called Autonomy. So it's actually broken up where Jonathan stands, but it's like it's a letter, f the letter A turned around, and the bar from the center of the letter A can do whatever it was wants. So it's like a deformed A, if you want so, because it's the letter A for Autonomy. We also felt that we need <laughs> uh, little icons for our toilet. And this is like a new installation that Jonathan worked on, which was quite fun. So we put that together like in a couple of days, but it was quite effective. So all these types, these letter forms, they like go over the edge and they interact with each other. And then we also asked our guests to paint a mask and wear them during the night. <laughs> no, that's not quite true. <laughs> but we did a little photo shoot with them. It was quite a fun activi activity um, and they got really into it. So you can see Again, John is an our designer. <laughs> and this is our little photo booth. It's basically just like a, a little room where we put all our you know, garden materials. Uh, by the end of the night, we just had like all these masks like hanging around in the bushes. It was a, turned out to be a really weird thing. <laughs> so 
just as a sign off, I just show you like our team. This is Patricia Finnegan, one of the founders. Um, wearing a mask. She's the uh, production manager or project manager. This is Tony Brook, uh, creative um, director of the studio. That's Jonathan. He's a senior designer. <laughs> Myself. I'm part of the team. Then Edie Lipa. She's a studio manager. And we also have two interns. That's Anais and Tim. And that's it for me. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, do you have some questions for Claudia tonight? <laughs> Can be anything. <laughs> yes. Just a joke. If you hurt Helvetica, can you keep your Swiss passport? I know. I will see you when I go back next time. <laughs> no, I'm sure they will be okay with that. <laughs> it's a good one. More, more questions or jokes or <laughs> about Helvetica? How to kill an Helvetica tonight? <laughs> it's a song from The Cure. Is to it? kill, not an Helvetica, uh -huh, but it's something <laughs> different. It's my, jo it it's my joke. <laughs> Just because I go quite often to Switzerland, Swiss designers, they don't use Helvetica so much. They, they rather use um, Universe and others. But Helvetica is not so commonplace in, in Switzerland, as, as, as far as I know it is. Yeah? Hmm. Well, maybe not anymore, for sure. But it's definitely a go-to font, I would say, mm -hmm. if you want to make it easy for yourself. It's a yeah. nice font, but... When the last, uh, your last visit in, in Switzerland to affirm that? No, every month. Every month. Ah. Wow. Ah. Any more question? <laughs> I have a question for you, actually. Yeah. Is, um, in your work, there is a lot of black and white. There is very few colors in the presentation, just at the end. Mm -hmm. So that's part of your style or the style <coughs> of, of spin, but it's not finished, my question. It's just the first part. And also, you use a lot of uh, you know, the black and white, mostly sans serif, mostly something around Helvetica or mm -hmm. very well built. Swiss style, sans serif, and uh, so no serif typeface, no colors, <laughs> but so it, for me as a type designer, it's very restrained universe. Mm. But in the same time, the other side, <laughs> when you are outside of the computer, you are, you are going crazy, you are going everywhere. Mm. You take the salad, you take you know, the lettuce, mm. you, take, you go to the garden, you, you do a lot of things who goes very far away. So you are very, very strict on the computer with your limitation, but outside, mm. you're going crazy all the time. Why, why is that? I would disagree with that. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> no, I think like we are, like, we are very uh, conscious about not making any rules up. It just happens to be now for like, the selection of work you've seen that there is a lot of black and white in it. That's true. <laughs> and a lot of sans serif typefaces, but obviously we don't restrict ourselves to any, anything. Um, I mean, we... Anything but not colors and not serif <laughs> typeface. That's not true. <laughs> you have seen serif typeface on the presentation? Mm. <laughs> All right, for the next project, I'm going to use a serif typeface no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> More question? No. <laughs>
more question? So it was perfect, there is nothing to say about it. Yes, you have a question? It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> so thank you very much, Claudia. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>